And I want to welcome you back to CKLU 96.7 FM. Uh, I'm your host, Bob Curley, and you're listening to The Learning Clinic. Uh, this afternoon, uh, my guest is Miranda Rocca Trucelli, and we've been talking about online education, training, uh, some of the challenges that young people face as they are going through um, their initial career, trying to, uh, to find where they belong in society. Um, Miranda, I want to go back just a bit to high school, and maybe even before high school. Oh my, okay. Because you're in a, a you're in a, a, a position now where you're you've got a company going. You've started your company. You're self-employed, and you're really into creativity, mm -hmm. big time. But in high school, you were math and science. I was. <laughs> and math and science is not always seen as a place for creativity it's it's black and white it's true. Now, there are other courses that that will allow for creativity while you're mm -hmm. taking your maths and sciences mm -hmm. let's go, go back a little bit further okay. into, your, into your elementary mm -hmm. school age what about Miranda growing up basically may have foretold that you were going to become the Miranda of today more interested in the creative creative side and okay. of life? Um, you know, it's funny. So my, my dad is an immigrant from Italy, and my mother came from an Italian family as well. And our first language was Italian. Um, and I have an older sister as well, who's a teacher as well. Uh, I shouldn't say as well, I'm not a teacher, but she is. And um, they sent us to um, a French school, completely French, French Catholic, without having any French background. They just kind of saw this vision and thought that that would, you know, help us out in our future. And my sister picked up on languages. And my sister's very creative as well, but in a completely different aspect. Um, but she picked up on the languages and she took more of the arts and, and, and that aspect. Um, and I always stuck with maths and sciences. And I think that's a little bit to do with my parents who you know, we came home from school, they weren't really able to help us with our homework, so we kind of had to learn it ourselves. And my sister seemed to gravitate towards languages. For some reason, she just picked those up innately. And my parents always used to help me with math, because math is obviously an international language. And so, you know, my dad would always teach me my math. And I guess because I excelled in that, because I had that extra help, I just always gravitated to the numbers and the facts because it was easier for me to to make sense of that and, and to be honest, my language skills were horrible. I couldn't write until I, even when I started doing my master's degree because I had been so heavily involved in, in sciences throughout my, my academic uh, experience that writing a paper was, it was atrocious. I had uh, friends who would, who would help me edit my work because they would just take one look at it and, and they couldn't believe that that was where I was at in terms of writing. So I was able to get, and you know, I'm the type of person that if I really want to do something and I want to excel, I will put my head down and I will learn it and I will work hard and I will do it. And now, of course, you know, my writing skills are phenomenal and I'm actually trying to write a book, which is taking me forever, but I, I just was able to plug in and, and learn something and, and take it and make it work for me. So I think what happened was, because I had that extra help and I had the confidence in, in numbers, that I, I always gravitated to the numbers. And so in high school, I was, you know, I was good at math and science, so I chose to take all my maths and sciences. You know, I took uh, an art class here and there because I was actually creative artistically as well, but it wasn't something that really drove me. For some reason, the satisfaction I got by, you know, accomplishing a calculus problem was more rewarding for me, um, very analytical. I don't know, you know, and I think everything always stems from your parents and your upbringing. I think, you know, if you go back to anything, you know, whether you even being a parent, whether you want to admit it or not, your, your children get their, their behaviors and, and, you know, what they're good at, what they're bad at. They, that stems from you as a parent. So I think I just somehow got that from my parents and, um, it was something that I just took to. And so when I was done high school, I 
thought I wanted to be a doctor and, and I knew I had to take more sciences and I was good at it. So I just kept going with it and kept going with it, not after one degree, but then another degree. And it was something that <clears throat> for me came, and, and I'm not saying it was always easy. There were times where, you know, I in university I, I failed classes and it wasn't because I wasn't smart enough or it was because I didn't put my head down and do the work because, you know, when you're having a good time in university, sometimes that takes over. Uh, putting too much on your plate, yeah. you know, trying to get too much done, taking, you know, 10 science courses instead of five, you know, probably would have done it as well. And I went back and I took courses, you know, whatever I failed, I took it over because I knew that I had to get it done. Um, and I, I think I really enjoyed myself in university. I had a good time. I have to say, if anything, I, I really, I had a great time, not just partying wise, but just life experience. Um, and like I said, it's it was just... the creative side of you coming out. I guess so, you know. So it just... And then when I was done and I realized, you know, for a moment you think you know what you want to do and it's not until... I think it's so hard for children, you know, when they're in... Whether it's elementary school or even secondary school, to decide at that moment what they want to do is such a hard thing to do. I mean, you really don't know what you want to do until you're thrown out there... <laughs> And you have to fend for yourself and figure out how am I going to survive? What am I passionate about? What's going to drive me to survive? That's when you're going to make a decision. I want to do this. This is what I love to do. And so I think that a lot of times people just choose something because they feel they have to. And that's, you know, that's the journey they choose. Um, so I'm really happy that I was confused. I'm really happy that after I got out of university, I was confused. I didn't know what I wanted to do because it makes you have to sit there and dissect your life and dissect your interests and really look at where you want to go, what you've done, what you want to do. It makes you do that. And I think that, you know, it, it's not a bad thing when people don't know what they want to do and they have this education and they, they you know, maybe they focused in psychology and now they don't know that that's the route they want to take. I don't think that matters. And I don't think that should be discouraging for anyone. I think that's part of life. I think that if you know what you want to do from the get-go, you're one in a million. Yeah. I think that you need to kind of have a little chaos in your life to determine where you really want to go. So it, It's funny because when I talk to people like yourself, um, and again, as you accumulate birthdays, you, you <laughs> can look back and say, boy, you know, we should be living backwards. We should. Um, and that's why I ask, because obviously there was something inside you that was creative, but you fell into doing what you were good at. Mm -hmm. And you stayed that way until you got into your master's. And I, I really see a lot of parallels, and, and I can understand it, because I ended up with a math degree and, and went into teacher's college because I wanted to teach math. And it wasn't until I took my master's degree in education that I started writing. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I started writing and, and essays, and, and and when, you, when you're into your master's degree, I always say that you almost should have your master's first and then your undergraduate degree last because master's is, is almost the first time where you're considered, um, you're almost considered as an equal to the teacher. Like, mm -hmm. it, this yeah, is the true. first time you get an education. That that's high. right. And so that's when I got into the writing. And I, I like you, had a lot of difficulty with writing, but I became a, a very good teacher in in languages <laughs> and I was a terrible teacher in math because I couldn't understand I couldn't remember what it was like not to understand math yeah and so it became very frustrating to teach students who had trouble grasping concepts mm -hmm. because I was so good in math right but when I was teaching students how to write mm -hmm. I knew where I came from mm -hmm. and I knew how to help them uh, Get better go through at it. the challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when you get into this whole career now that you're in, in terms of helping people with their education and their development and their, and their creativity, mm -hmm. you were almost destined for that back when you were in elementary school. I mean... You, you I, took a detour. Yeah, no, I see that. And I think that even when I first started teaching, and I was teaching in post-secondary, I was teaching sciences and, and all that fun stuff. <clears throat> I um, I think that's what helped with my consulting ability as well, was the patience. Um, 
with others and respecting where they were at and you know where they could be and taking them along that journey and I think that's what consulting is about is when you meet with a client you have to assess where they're at respect where they're at and then try to you know strategically move them in a direction that's going to take them to the next level yeah, as long as it's moving in that right direction mm -hmm. and I and I and you're right I mean when I started my master's degree at first it was a little taxing because I didn't have the skill of writing and I wanted to be successful and so I um, I, I put my head down and I just I got good at it and now you're right I, I love to write and I don't think I could teach writing though I think that 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 for me wouldn't work but I think uh, I, I think it has contributed to my consulting because I'm you know that's how I work with clients is how if they were a student it's the same yeah. relationship and um, well it helps you uh, address the needs in terms of the training programs because you, you one of your uh, one of the areas that you work on is developing the curriculum developing mm -hmm. the program and so when you're developing the program and you and you have a sense of um, there will be some students who will have the same challenges in learning this material as I did when I was in my master's mm -hmm. then you kind of develop the curriculum and, and the whole program geared to that mm -hmm. whereas if you were developing it based on what your knowledge was as you were getting your science degrees you would develop it in an approach that well they they have to be able to get this mm -hmm. No, it's true because, you know, one thing you do acquire is looking at the participants' needs. And that's really important to me is that anyone can develop education or programs, but you have to always fine-tune it to the participants' needs. And when you do think back to a time when you were a student and how hard it was to learn something, it wasn't designed for you. And so what I do in anything I do is I always look at what are the, you know, what are the participants' needs? What's going to make them learn this? the best and so I always design things I think the hardest thing is and you mentioned it you know when you were so advanced in math to kind of simplify it the challenge is sometimes to make things so simple that anyone can understand them and that's what I try to do with everything uh, whether it's writing my book or it's developing curriculum is to make it so simple and so structured you know and that's where the pedagogy comes in that anybody can learn it if you have no knowledge of being an electrician you should be able to take this course and understand it fully and and that's where you know I think that I differentiate from you know others and the experience I've gotten is that you know you can do that and you understand that as well and you appreciate that that you have to make things so simple as a teacher I mean that's your job but I think people lose that as they progress through life and they become less patient um, so I think that you know and this goes back to saying you know I think it's important to have post-secondary education because all of that has led to where I'm at. So to say that going through all these degrees did nothing for me would be a lie because I do believe it did great stuff for me, just not in the traditional <laughs> way that people would think that you know education would contribute to you know success. And I mean, well, success in terms of what they. That's right. What have you that's right. Success. Doesn't mean you're gonna get that golden ticket job somewhere, someone's gonna open the door and offer you CEO position somewhere. It doesn't work that way. But what it does give you is as a different learning experience, a life experience, and you acquire skills and knowledge that you wouldn't have acquired anywhere else. So I think education's important. Um, you know, and obviously you're you're acquiring specific information about a subject that you're studying, which I think can help you in different aspects of your life as well. I mean for me I'm so happy I took sciences because again I can I can understand things at a more profound level, at a subatomic level really, yeah. <laughs> and you know that for me and that's why you know even doing a master's degree in a completely different realm, I think has you know, given me this kind of well-rounded ability to understand things differently and, and to proceed differently in life. So having the writing and then the science, I think is a great combination for me personally. So I think education is important. I think it is a key to success, but not the traditional form of success that people would think. Um, I think it definitely builds on who you are, and I think it definitely, you know, is part of your journey. I think, you know, I'm definitely going to encourage my kids to go to school, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know. Um, and I guess if, if we take a look now at, at how this relates to developing a training program for a company, I think that's where I, I started to get into earlier about, well, even if you're, you're going to do a training program that's got more to do with health and wellness as opposed to the welding that this mm -hmm. company does. 
it's improving that employee somehow mm -hmm. and, and making that employee a better person, which then is going to make them a better totally. employee. And so your whole idea of, of, of training and professional development doesn't have to be more welding courses. No, that's right. It's more courses to People improve development. yourself. That's right. So, and, and I think that will be a huge culture shift in the leaders oh, totally. because I, you've got, your first question is going to be, well, how is that going to give me a return on investment? Oh, you always get that. And I mean, you're investing in your people. Yeah. And it's not, and again, it's not even just the content. It's how it's done. There has to be pedagogy. You know, a lot of companies say, oh, we do this. Well, do you work with instructional designers? Do you work with professionals in the field? No. Well, then there's no, a good chance that you're not. Here for 25 years. Yeah, right? exactly. So there's a good chance they're not doing it as effectively as it can be done. doesn't mean they're doing it poorly or whatever, but it means that it can be done better. And again, you know, you're not going to go to a heart surgeon if you need brain surgery. There's people who specialize in fields. And I think people have to start to appreciate that there's people who specialize in certain fields, even in education. And you can help make education better. You can help employees improve their skills, or whether it's life skills or even, you know, specific skills in that area that they're practicing. It, it really, there's a cost effectiveness to it, especially if it's online. But... I mean, when you have better trained people, when you have people who value their positions, who can work better, you're going to get a return on investment. You're not going to get it tomorrow, but you're going to get it eventually. And so people have to look at that long-term goal and long-term vision and understand that this is going to make our company better if we do it right. Yeah. Any improvement will make your company better. Uh, I think that that's the, the whole challenge you get across to people. You mentioned in, in your in your background too. You um, were involved with the uh, Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. Yes, so I received. Did that help? Uh... Um, it definitely helped because what it did do for mm -hmm. me is you know making the decision. I think the hardest decision is to decide to go on your own and start a business, mm -hmm. and having an organization to support you because in order for them to provide you with a grant, they obviously have to support your vision. That was more emotionally backing and and just solidified my intention to have my own business knowing that I had this organization who reviewed my proposal they see the need as much as I see the need and they're willing to fund my startup it definitely helped because it helped me get my startup you know stuff I, and I did put into marketing and I mean I'll talk about marketing in a second so it did help it did support me in my decision the thing is, you know, a few years later I was interviewed by them because I was still in business. And the reality is that many businesses don't continue. You get this great startup, this great ammunition, this push, you know, and you start going and then you realize that it's not as easy as maybe you had expected. And so in your second year, your third year, how many people make keep making it? And even in my interview, you know, there you know, they couldn't give me numbers obviously, but there aren't many people who continue to go forward because it's probably it's, consistent with the bell curve. It, I'm sure it is because the 5%. if there's the five percent, I mean it's hard. Yeah, there's just kind of there needs to be on. yeah, and there needs to be I think some sort of program that will help you out in that second, third, fourth year to continue to move ahead because as you start to grow, and not even just grow your business, but grow your ideas, grow your contact list. There's things that you want to invest in because now you know what you need to do. And if there were programs that helped to fuel you midway through, I think it would help entrepreneurs continue that route because so many just, and I understand it. I mean, it's, it's really, I didn't give up because I had nothing to really give up. Yeah. And like, I mean, how do you give up air? You, well, you don't. So I just kept going in the direction I was, I was, the only de direction I was let, let in. So, you didn't have a lot of other options. I didn't have any other options, really. I, I didn't. And I, I knew I had to provide for my family. There was, you know, no other option, especially, like I said, when my husband was on strike. It, it wasn't like I could go get a job somewhere. I tried that, and it wasn't working. So I had to make this work. I absolutely had no choice. So I, and, I, and I did in the end. But um, And that's probably the 5% of the people that are desperate enough to make it happen. Yeah. You know, when you have, someone told me, you know, when you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to lose. And, and those are the people who actually make it yeah. in life because you keep going. There is nothing else to give up. Yeah. Um, so 
you know, and I, I just I just kept going. And it, what does keep going? What does that even mean? Yeah. What that means is, you know, you, you don't stop picking up the phone and calling people. You don't stop trying to meet people. You don't stop trying to get your business out there, to talk about it, to give out your business cards. How many business cards did I waste? Oh, I'm sure millions, but you got to keep doing it. <clears throat> I mean... But you don't waste anything. No, you don't and, in and the that's, end. And that's the one thing. That's the one thing. That's the marketing. I believe that any energy you put out there will always return to you. You don't know when, you don't know how, but anything you put out there, especially if it's positive, it's always going to come back to you. Yep. And for me, you know, I knew that at some point this would all come back and it would all make sense. And, you know, it finally does. But it took almost five years for that to make sense. And there are so many outside forces that you have no control over that keep popping up. 100%. It's I mean, there's challenges. I mean, being self-employed, I never thought I would face some of the challenges that I've had to face. But I think in the end, it's only made my business stronger and it's only made me stronger. But, you know, and these are these are things that I guess you have to go through as a business in order to, to continue to grow. Um, yeah, I've even tried marketing and I did that with the NOHFC grant. I think you have to be established before marketing and advertising really truly works for you. It's like if you're driving down the road and you see a sign for McDonald's and right beside you see a sign for a no-name diner. Well, you're going to go to the place you know, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, now I'm starting to get back into advertising very loosely because, you know, people now know about my business. They know who I am. And, you know, they'll actually maybe follow up to the ad. So, um, and, and when are you not marketing? Well, you, you always are, right? Yeah. Every, everywhere you go, everything you do, you're, you're always talking about, you know, your business. And yeah. you're you always thinking of... Pardon? You may not be advertising. All no, you, but you're always marketing. You are. I mean, even when you go to the doctor's office, you think of this great project that your doctor might, <laughs> might want to do. So you're always throwing out ideas. And I think that that's the key in being a successful entrepreneur is that you have to keep that creative juice flowing because you can't become complacent. The moment you become complacent is the moment that you are not going to be successful. Now, where do we, where does a person learn this, though? Because I, 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 ran, in, I ran into that when I was teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll always remember the comments. I, I, I would play slow pitch with the guys, and, and I taught in the same town where I lived. Okay. And, um, you know, it was always kind of funny. The guys would joke with me about the fact that you know, how come I never swore like everybody else? And how come my, my language was, you know, I would never swear if, if my life depended on it. And I told him, you know, I, I teach. I said, I can't have that become part of my mm -hmm. way of life. Well, you make the choice, right? Yeah. I, and I said, that was my choice. And I said, that's what I'm, I said, if I'm out on the schoolyard, they were, I'm out on a ball field and I'm, I'm talking like a trooper here and, and my students happen to be around listening to me, how am I going to go back in the classroom mm -hmm. and have them look at me the same way? Well, that's a choice to make. I mean, some it teachers is. don't make that choice. It's just that you're always marketing. You and, are. And, and, and you are. most of learning is caught. I, I use that term, most of learning is caught, not mm -hmm. taught. People are watching oh, totally. you. Your, your kids are watching you. They're learning more from you by watching you than... Oh, 100%. I true, And that's kind of what drove me to, you know, those moments of despair, and those moments that were really challenging that. I had to pick myself up because I knew that my kids were watching me. They may not have fully understood, but they could read what was happening. Yeah. And I didn't want them to feel what I was feeling. And so I'd have to, you know, just figure out a way. Um, and you, you, you asked how, you, you know, you just, how you learn these things. And in those moments of despair and in those moments where there was no opportunity, I am the type of person who needs to continuously learn. So even if I'm not, and I've made that choice, that's just part of who I've decided to be, is that I like to learn new experiences. So I chose to make my life basically my classroom. Right. And so I was open to learning all these experiences that were coming to me. And instead of letting them you know, chew me up and spit me out, I thought, no, this is a learning experience. I'm gonna learn how to make it through this so that I can acquire skills and knowledge that I wouldn't get anywhere else. And so I made the choice that every situation that came to me wasn't, you know, just a situation. It was this learning experience that I had to, you know, like this mountain. I had to learn how to climb it, and I had to get to the top, be successful, and move on to the next one. And so for me, I just took everything as a learning experience. It didn't matter what it was, and it didn't matter if I, in that moment it was 
incredibly challenging and I had to shed my tears, I just took that as, okay, I can do this. Take a moment, take a moment to breathe. Think of your children, think of you know where you wanna go, keep that goal in mind, learn from it and move ahead. So I did that, I did, and I still do that. I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Anything that presents itself, I, I try to, and I guess that's where my analytic <laughs> analytic skills come in, and I kind of dissect it, look at it, and say, okay, how could I learn from this? What can I do to gain something great from this? So, so, so basically, then when you take a look at the, the whole learning experience approach, probably the toughest person to convince uh, to, to accept one of your, your programs is the manager or the owner. Definitely. Who, who has to understand that unless that owner really shows an awful lot of uh, respect and uh, appreciation for his own or her own mm -hmm. professional development, you can't expect the employees that's right. to, to accept that. Oh, it's completely reflective. And I think that that's another experience that I've decided to learn from is that as I grow and like to become, you know, the biggest and the best, I will become the biggest and the best because I want to reflect the type of behavior and the type of people in you know within myself so I want to be that great boss and I don't even like the term boss but I want to create an environment that lives and thrives in creativity and, and I have you know I've come in encounter with some organizations that do that that encourages creativity that they treat people the way they want to be treated and I want to be able to do that and that's kind of you know, the fact that I want to have a successful business is one thing, but I want to have this environment where people feel welcome, where they feel that they can, they can grow to, you know, surpass their boss because the, those rules don't apply. I want people to be able to just do great work and feel good about what they do. And, and to me, that is, you know, part of the goal, you know, as the whole picture of having a successful business. That's a piece of it. So, and you know, that, so I've learned from, Places that I've encountered and even people who you know are dealing with situations in their workplace that they've shared with me I don't ever want to be in an environment like that and when you're self-employed you get to pick and choose who you work with so if you do get the, the managers and the people who are you know reflective of, of where you're going in your vision well you can choose to not work with them and, and it gives you flexibility that way um, you know I just I really you know I, I, I'm I like the approach of like-mindedness and when you're working with people who are like-minded, you will become, you know, successful. Um, and for me, success is really just, just loving what you do, being happy, being fulfilled. You know, waking up in the morning and just knowing that you have this great project or this great business to go to, and and you're just you, you're just fulfilled. You're happy. You enjoy your life. You enjoy going to work. I see the the whole baby boom generation, um, who who many of them got into careers because they were good at it. And many of them spent their entire life not enjoying what they did, but mm -hmm. they were good at it and they did it. And uh, now that they are uh, retiring or getting to the retirement age. They're discovering themselves all over again. <laughs> they're starting to, they're starting sure. up. And, and what they're doing now is in many, and this is why I think it's gonna be even more difficult for young people to find work. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the baby boomers are saying, you know what, I'm 50 or I'm 60. Uh, the traditional career of 35 years is gone. Most mm -hmm. careers now, the lifetime of a career is five to mm -hmm. 10 years. And most people at the age of 60 are looking now saying, I've got two careers left in me. Totally. Two different ones. Oh yeah. I, I, and not only that, I've got all of these skills and all these networks that, that are already established. I may have to take a course for a year, but I can do what I love now instead of Doing what I was doing. Right, right, which which this that contributes to a whole new uh, you know issue with right. with young people not being able to find jobs, right? So I mean, and I think that's, that's why important. You should live backwards. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's an important point because you know for me, I always knew that my dad loved what he did, and he was one of the few people who I knew woke up early, loved okay. going to work. Yeah. You know, he would he would work 12, 13 hours a day, but he he was tired, but he enjoyed what he did. Yeah, and, new story every half hour though. Exactly. Yeah, no, totally. And I mean, I can see where, you know, what he does is just so much fun. And I can see now where, what I do is so much fun because every client I get to meet is a new experience and a new story. And, you know, I guess having seen that my dad, and I saw that it was hard. I mean, I definitely picked that up when I was small, that it was hard what he was doing, trying to build something from nothing. You know, having immigrated here, and 
you know, he had nothing to, to start off with. But um, I guess that innately kind of gave me that skill and that motivation to do that and to love what I did. Because so often you do encounter people who, who have just fallen into these positions who aren't happy. And I think that, you know, when you take those chances, you know, a lot of people, it's that job security. They don't want to lose that paycheck. But I can only tell you and reassure you that, yeah, it's hard when you lose that paycheck, but you discover so much more about yourself, about life, when you take that leap of faith. Your generation is willing to do that. Well, I mean, the, you know, to be honest, I, I have to say there's very few people I've encountered who are in my generation who are doing what I do. In fact, I have to say that I don't even think I know anybody else who is doing what I'm doing. Self-employed work. Who is completely 150% self-employed. I mean, actually, I have met a few people who who are, are taking on that challenge, but very, 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 very few. And it just, you know, you hear the challenges they're going through, and, and they're, they're going through the things that they would feel, the emotions, the, the complacency, the depression that you wouldn't really get until you maybe been in your job for like 20, 30 years, and they're feeling it already because they're being, yeah. they're going in a direction that is not in sync with who they are. Yeah. And, I mean, it's hard. We went without a paycheck. We almost lost everything. It was the hardest time of our lives, but I honestly, I would never do it again. But I'm happy I did it. Yeah. I, I used to tell that to uh, young teachers. I was a union president for nine years. And when new teachers were coming into the career, uh, if they were starting to run into roadblocks, I'd tell them, if, if this is not your career, you have to get out before five years. You do. If you stay beyond five years, you're going to stay for the paycheck. You do. And you know what? When you, when you encounter people who, who have taken a chance, you have like this great appreciation for them because you know what they've gone through and that they actually bit the bullet, they jumped off that cliff, you know, they actually took that leap of faith and, and they're still doing it. I, there's just something that's so rewarding about meeting people who are doing that. And it's very, I honestly think I've met, like, I don't even want to say a handful. There's, there's, I, I, it's really hard to, to speak to others who have, you know, this common... It's hard because you have to learn how to recognize opportunity. Mm -hmm. There are opportunities, but yeah. you walk right by them most of the time. Oh, you do. I, do. I actually remember listening to James Cameron. He was on Oprah once, and he said, you know, sometimes you have to recognize that when that door opens just a crack. That's your opportunity knocking, and you need to just take it. Yeah. I mean, the doors aren't going to fly open for you. They're not. And like I said, most of the time, I've had them slam in my face. And... You know, that's devastating when you're trying to raise children, you're trying to build this business, and all you're getting is this rejection, rejection, rejection. It's hard, and very few people, I can see why so many people would just turn around and say, I'm done, I can't do this. Yeah. It's why the, the profession of being a salesperson is one of the greatest shortages that we have today. I, yeah. Very few people you know what? And are very, salespersons. I've met salespeople, and I have to say, there's very few that I've met that are that really really surprised me and impressed me because having been a salesperson having been every position that you could possibly and think of in your own business you are a salesperson now i well i definitely am a salesperson and, and i think i'm a pretty good one now but yeah you it's a skill that you have to acquire and yeah. if you don't acquire it the right way <laughs> i'll never forget uh, a story i once heard about uh, this uh, company that sent, or two companies that sent uh, sales reps to an island. And uh, you know, the first sales rep called his company and said, uh, you gotta send me home. None of the people here are wearing shoes. They don't wear shoes in this island. And the second sales rep called his company and said, you gotta pump up production and send some more sales reps here. None of these people have shoes. See but the one difference, of, yeah. One of them is looking at the opportunity. That's right. Looking at no point in selling here, nobody has them. I, I mean, I've learned to see opportunity in every situation. And, you know, despite people talking about the economy and all the stuff, I still have always been incredibly opportunistic. And I mean, even when the doors are slammed in my face, um, there's always opportunity if you're willing to seek opportunity. And again, I don't believe that anyone's ever going to create opportunity for you. I think there may be an angel that falls from heaven every now and then who's willing to help you out. But I think that you have to be willing and motivated to create your own opportunity time and time again because 
you're the only person who really cares about your own <laughs> yourself. Yep. You know, sure you have family and friends, and I, and I get that, but at the end of the day, the only person that's going to make you successful is yourself. Yep. If you can't make yourself successful, nobody else will. And and you know, getting acquiring the skills to do that, you have to be willing to learn. You know, everything has to be a learning experience for you, or you won't you won't do it. The, the future, I guess, is uh, unknown for you. Uh, every day is, is a, a new experience. So it's unknown, but the end goal is known. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, and you got to, you know that there's a, there's a goal. And, and I'm one of these people that really believe that I don't think you should ever expect to get to the top of the mountain. That there will always be a journey. Oh, totally. Because that would be probably disappointing if you ever get to the top. I mean, the, the thing is, I don't believe that there's one set goal. I constantly reinvent those goals. Yeah. So I do think that anytime you achieve that goal, it just creates opportunity again for a new goal. Yeah. And that's how, you know, I have these great visions, but these visions continue to grow as I grow. Yeah. It's almost like uh, what happens when I'm doing renovations around the house. I, I finish one job and I yeah. create three you tear down one while you... <laughs> end up tearing down four. Three, three more jobs from that. <laughs> that's exactly. And I, and I think that's how, that's what life's about is, is that's what living is, is creating these new environments for yourself to thrive and to grow yourself as a human being. I think that you have to seek those opportunities and you have to seek growth and create these great experiences for yourself. I mean, that's, I couldn't imagine living any other life than, than this great life that I'm living because I really do and it's taken a while I mean there were times where it was hard to get up in the morning and I mean I can't lie about that because it, that's an experience I think that can help people yeah. um, you know having to again deal with the fact that you know this proposal got rejected that proposal 100 proposals have been rejected what do yeah. I do now I know. and you're, you're, you're somebody going to say yes I know and it's like you know and you may never get that yes but you'll get it somewhere else yeah. and you know that to me I mean, it's taken five years. It seems like it's gone by so fast, but in those moments, it's it's gone by so slow. But I just, it's how you look at it. It's yeah. your outlook on it. You know, what's, what's discouraging a little bit is that your own two daughters have the skill that they would need in order to be successful at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Because most children that are in your infancy, they don't understand how not to continue asking. That's right. Like, no doesn't mean I'm not going to ask you again. I'm going <laughs> to ask you again and again and again. It's true. Until I get a yes. That's or I'm right. going to ask somebody else to like it. And yet, it doesn't take us long to, to beat lose that, that out of I know. And I, I think that that is my, you know, that's what made me move ahead is knowing that I want to be able to tell them that they can be and do anything they want regardless of who says no to them because no doesn't mean no it makes it tougher to be a mother <laughs> oh yeah i mean i think my role's already been challenged quite a few times as a mother in various aspects but i think that it's it's how we should raise our children encourage that creativity encourage them but there's a way of doing it right there you know you don't just keep pounding at the door you you just there's a strategic way of yeah. doing it yeah. and to teach them those skills try to handle and see if it's unlocked that's right you know so there's there's ways of teaching them how you know and that's that's for them if they choose to acquire those skills yeah. then you know they'll but for me i want to be able to tell them the story yeah. of my success so that it encourages their success yeah. we're going to um we're going to try and, and have you come back you know, on, a, on a periodic basis to talk about certain topics as the, that come up over the year. Um, one of the things we are going to do is, is make sure that this goes online in, in audio and video form so that people can access what we've talked about, especially people who haven't had a chance to listen to it. Because I, I think that whether you're an employer or an employee or a student or a parent, um, you don't have to be interested in, in providing training programs for companies to mm -hmm. learn an awful lot of things about life from what we talked about. And, and a lot of these things are, are basic um, yeah. living <laughs> strategies, it, regardless of what, a, what line of work you're in. And uh, I, 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 I think that we continually have to allow younger people and people that are looking at getting uh, 
you know, into another line of work or, or bettering themselves, we have to continue giving them opportunity to learn from people who maybe have gone through mm -hmm. and, and, and can say to them, chin up, it mm -hmm. does get better, mm -hmm. believe me. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you keep moving, it, it, and, and it's, nobody gets into the top positions easily. No, Very but you wouldn't appreciate them if you got into no. them so easily, right? No. no. So, um, Miranda, your website address, we'll, we'll put it on our website, mm -hmm. but your website address is what? www.creativeelearningdesign.ca so you can think of creative learning design, but make sure you put in the e-learning. That's right. And um, uh, it, it, it's been great. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you feel we should be? No. <laughs> I think we touched on. I think we touched on a lot. I think yeah. you know, definitely encouraging. I think there's a huge value in learning from other people's experience. So I think that that's great. You know, oh. what you do here as well, yeah. sharing people's experiences, because I think we need to encourage a new generation of of young independent you know entrepreneurs who are ready to take on the world and well said mm -hmm. Miranda Rock Cicelli um, thank you for being with me uh, I want to remind everyone that this is the learning clinic and you're listening to us on CKLU 96.7 FM in Sudbury at Laurentian University um, shows are on every Monday afternoon from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock um, we have a guest, three guests coming in at two o'clock from uh, Professions North. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, those guests in, in a few minutes. If you go to the learningclinic.ca and go to the radio site, you will be able to find the video segment of this um, the show probably within the next two or three days. So, so people will be able to uh, listen to it if they want, or listen to parts of it, turn us up or down. And, mm -hmm. or, do whatever they want. But uh, yeah, I think we've covered an awful lot. Thanks for coming in, Miranda. And, and again, we will uh, we'll look forward to some other great discussions. Uh, some <laughs> other discussions and, and some other uh, topics that will be pertinent. Thank you for having me. Great. Okay. And uh, I will be back after a short break. Uh, in the meantime, enjoy the music.